it's been a tough go here, but I think it's going to change. We're not some of the things uh, we're talking about this morning is reverence and reverence for the Lord, even when there's not a crowd to be to please, you know, we, we just do these in, in private with the Lord and, and he responds to us with those secret things we, we do in life because I do know a lot of times that, and I think it's just the nature of who we are as people, you know, we, we somehow feel good when, when there's somebody there to appreciate our efforts, <laughs> yes. you, you know, and they give us the pat on the back and the acceptance and the, all those things. And that uh, is a wonderful thing and it does make us feel good and, and appreciate it and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we're, we, we do it for the Lord and absent of all those people, he's the same thing definitely appreciates us and accepts us and accepts that and and that that's that sense of, of reverence and that's something I, I want to, to bring back to, to this place is that even if no one came, we have reverence for it as being a place of worship. Somebody dedicated their lives, their talents, their work to to making this a, a place of worship, and, and it comes through that reverence. And, and God will respond somewhere along the line in, in bringing people in because we reverence it, because we hold it up in high esteem, and, and we care about it. And that's what God is looking at, is our heart each one of our own hearts and so that's kind of where we're going to talk about we're going to talk about head coverings and how Jesus is our head covering whoever we are wherever we are and, and in that the head covering of, of that day of what Paul was talking to with the Corinthians for women it was a cultural thing and how they it was like wearing a wedding ring and so it was a sign to all the other men around in the area that they were taken, they were married. And it was the woman's response of showing reverence to their husband, of displaying herself to the community as being taken. And so we'll talk about that a little bit of our reverence to the Lord and what that kind of means. But I want to begin with a prayer, and, and if you guys have any prayer requests, just uh, let me know, and, and we'll include those in there. Uh, I think right now we all need prayer. <laughs> Everybody, and, and uh, no matter where we are. I'd also like to throw in praying for this country. This country is in such need of the Lord yeah. in every aspect, every way. And I feel like if I just pray it myself, it's not enough. Right? We need to get more to, to pray for this country. So that's my prayer request right now, just as a whole. Yes, I agree with you. We, as a, as a people, need to pray for the country. That's what keeps us safe, it is God, Jesus. He's the solution to, to our struggles, our problems in our daily life, and so we need him. In the midst of our government, in the midst of our towns, communities, all around, in our own homes, we need God in everything and everywhere, so. If you join me. Heavenly Father, our Father, we love you and we thank you so much for joining us together here by the power of your mighty name. We know that whenever we gather together here with you, that you are definitely present. And so we speak to you and we talk to you in such a way that we expect change. We expect miracles. We expect to see the mighty work of your hand 
in our lives and within our nation. We definitely pray for those who are been, been put in charge of governing over us and setting the rules and protecting us and seeing to it that we have access to help and provisions no matter where we are in life. And we just thank you, Lord, for all the good things you are doing throughout the world and throughout our country. We love seeing the camaraderie and the helping hands that respond to all the disasters going on in the world, I just ask that you would place within us strength to do those things for one another absent of the disaster. That it would just become a part of our daily life as we seek to do good things and project goodwill to one another no matter where we are in life. Because somehow, some way, we all struggle with our daily problems. So be the strength that provides the solution for our struggles. Strengthen our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our soul. We thank you, Jesus, because we know all good things are coming from you. We thank you for those good things. I love you, and I welcome you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, today I want to talk, we're going to talk about head coverings, and, and I know and recognize and understand, and, and a lot of it, of our daily knowledge, we sometimes take things out of context and not recognizing who Paul is talking to. He's not, like, talking to us, even though we can learn from all these things and all this stuff we can take and apply it to our lives. He's talking to the Corinthian people of this day as we're at 1 Corinthians chapters 11 and those people are not even Greek people in that day. So around 45 years before Paul comes into Corinthian, the Greeks, the Corinthians, rose up against Rome. And so Rome went out and burnt it to the ground and killed every man they could find and every male child they could find within that vicinity. And so the Greeks were dispersed. Now, Corinth is a place of, of where they have the, uh, you know, the Corinthmas, and I forget how to say that properly, but there's a little piece of land there, and so it's a hub, and it connects the Black Sea or the whatever it is with the Mediterranean Sea, and there's the two seas there, and there's just this four miles of land there. So it's a place to bring goods. It's a place of opportunity for merchants and trading and that. So the Roman citizens... And, and it was a, a great place for freed men. So people who were sold themselves as a bond servant to Rome to become citizens of Rome, fulfilled their desire, their, their time. And, and so they would then have the opportunity and they would transfer to Corinth for entrepreneur type things. They would go there to start a business, to sell clothing, to sell dyes, to be a part of the trade. And so it was a place where the Romans were taking Roman citizens and they were placing them in there, making it a, a, a hub of Rome, basically. So there are people from all over. And, and it's a place where there's a lot of sin going on. It's kind of like uh, likened to in our day to something like uh, Las Vegas, you know. People from all over the world go to Las Vegas to do same things. And, and then that, there's a lot of people who start up businesses and try to take advantage of the tourism that's going on there. It's the same thing kind of happening in, in this area. And so he's talking to these Roman people who have just recently converted to Christianity. And with that, they're bringing with them 
some of their old habits and the old traditions and their pagan style religion they're bringing with them. And that's where Paul is kind of trying to correct them that it, when you're a Christian and you give yourself to Jesus Christ, fully give yourself to the Lord as, as a wife gives herself to a husband, knowing that the Lord is the head of the woman, head of the church, head of the man. It's all about Christ being the head. And so I want to read this a little bit and we'll get into it a little more as it says this. Now I command you, and again we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now I command you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short, but since it is disgraceful for the wife to cut her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman but woman for man. That is why we ought to have a symbol of authority on her, on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, the Lord, in the Lord, women is not independent of man nor man of the woman for as woman, as a, or for as women, was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourself, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? And so, again, we're reminding ourselves, Jesus is the head covering, and so we're bringing reverence to Jesus. So, in that day, he's talking to Roman people, and so Roman people have the toga and that was a, a a sign to the world that i'm a roman citizen i earned my citizenship or i was born into my citizenship the toga was a, a status symbol and so they had lower class they had the middle class they had the upper class and then they had the roman citizen class and they really sought after those classifications. You had the, the slave person or the bond servant, and each class or classification of these groups of people were treated completely different. And, but the guy with the Roman toga, he's separated from all the rest. So he is a mayor, a governor, a high priest. He's somebody of some sort of, of importance into the community and being the roman way of life they would have and, and i have a prayer so but they would have their toga and, and they would come into a room and because they're of high status they have the right to have connection with god slaves can't be connecting with the gods or god you're, you're worthless <laughs> you are not in right standing. You, you have to be somebody of importance to have a connection with God. Not just anybody could have a connection to God. And yet Paul is saying everyone in Christ has connection with Jesus Christ. You do not need somebody to cover over your head. So the Roman people would come in and the governor or the mayor 
or this person of importance, he might see a, a crowd or a group of people, and he would come in, and he's going to pray, and he's going to cover his head with his toga, and then he is going to begin to pray over everyone and for everyone. And he is the official voice for everyone that's connecting everyone to God. And then you can't just be doing that. And women in that day are, are like the least of the least. They are a possession. They're a commodity. They do not have what we have today of being treated as equal human beings. And Paul's saying the same as even though man or the woman or woman came from the man and now a man comes from the woman, we're all equal. We all have the opportunity to come to God and Jesus, absent of anybody else. We don't need that. And so it was dishonoring for the man to come in and cover his head and pray over a woman. It's robbing her right to be connected to Jesus Christ freely, by faith, by faith. And, and so... They didn't need that. And Paul's saying, it's just that the, the natural beauty of your hair was good enough. And God distinguishes the difference between man and woman by the way they look, the way they dress, and the way they act. So men should have short hair and look like men and act like men. And women should look like women and act like women and be like women. But together, whether we're Jew, slave, free person, male or female, Gentile or whatever, in Christ Jesus, we all have the same ability to come to Jesus Christ and be heard. And believing as, as this woman, your, your head covering is Jesus. And, and your faithfulness is shown to your reverence to Jesus in the same way as a woman in that day and in their culture, she would cover her head showing the, the town, I'm married. So they didn't have wedding rings like we do today. They would cover their heads. A woman with a covered head is married. All men are to respect that and honor that. You don't go hitting on or messing with a married woman. They, they had standards. They had some morals back then even though they were in a pagan society, they still had a sense of right and wrong. And so Paul is saying the same thing, that if your head is covered, you're displaying a sense of reverence to the community, to everyone around, that I'm married, and I'm married to Jesus Christ. And I can come to my husband anytime I want and ask my husband for anything I want, just as... A husband is the provider of food, the provider of the home, the provider of protection. You show and you display your reverence for Jesus Christ by believing that. He is the provider of your home, the provider of your protection, the provider of your food, or whatever it may need, or whatever you may need. You come to the Lord. You don't go out messing around. You're married to the Lord. And you go to the Lord for these things, these help, our problems, our issues, our depression, or whatever it is we have, we bring it to the Lord. And that's a display of reverence. Now, these people in that day, the Corinthian people and the Roman people had hundreds of gods and they were sacrificed. So they would, I need love in my life. So they make a sacrifice to Cupid. And Cupid is a real God. And, or they would make a sacrifice to the God of Diana, or Archimedes, or Apollo, or Zeus, or whatever it may be. And, and all of these gods had a different function. I was a god of fertility, a god of love, a, a God to protect over your home, a God to protect over your finances, a God to yield crops or, or produce from your crops. And they were making all kinds of sacrifices to these gods. 
and then they'd come to church, and they'd go home, and they'd make their sacrifices. And, and it's abandon that all together. We, we abandon all of those things because we don't need a sacrifice. The only sacrifice that was ever made or need to be made was that of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us to reconcile us to him. So again, the, the, the displaying of reverence and honor that Christ is your head or head covering, you, you, you let go of all those things. A lot of people in, in our world and that they still are Christians, go to church, and then when having relationship problems, I'm gonna go see a medium. I'm gonna to go to that medium and this fortune teller and they're gonna read my cards or read my palm or read whatever it is. They're gonna find favor in my fortune. And in that, it's dishonoring to God. It's no reverence to the Lord. <clears throat> and if we're married, and we display our rings proudly as, as being married, or if we're a woman and we have our head covering us, displaying ourselves as being married, and Christ is our head covering, don't go to mediums or sorcery, palm readers. They are not gonna help you. In fact, they're probably gonna lead you down a path where you're gonna find more disappointment, more problems, you're going to find yourself further separated from the Lord. As he's saying, your reverence, your love for me is displayed through your obedience. And it's not obedience, I do this or I do that because I have to. It's more like because I love you, because I trust in you, I, I give you my problem. I believe you, you know how to deal with my problems better than anyone out there because you love every detail about me. So we don't have a lot of time for today, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to go through Exodus chapters 26, 27, and 28 as God in there is speaking about the building of the tabernacle and, and the sacred clothing or covering of the high priest and how, what made those things sacred? Their willingness to obey God's commands. And even if his command is wear a purple and red scarlet with gold woven in, kind of an outfit, the, the headdress and all these things, and he tells you exactly how to make it, and you follow those instructions, that's showing reverence and honor to God. And in that, God is saying, that's what makes it sacred. So many of us in our lives, I think, get lost to think, or don't think that marriage is sacred. And yet we're married to the Lord. No matter who we are, we are the bride of Christ. And, and what makes that sacred? Our reverence for it. And, and how do we display that? By giving to the Lord my weaknesses. If you're going to protect over me, let me admit that I'm weak. And I need your protection. So when I need your protection, I come to you for strength and protection. Let me admit that what I, I, a good husband does he provides a home, a shelter for me. So during those times when the weather is stormy or whatever it is, I have protection. And it comes from this house that the Lord has built. And so when I'm afraid in the midst of a storm, the stormy parts of life, I, I come to the Lord. I go to the Lord for everything. And, and I seek for advice, you see, in Exodus as he's talking about the tabernacle and the high priest garments and all those things that he does those things so that we can have relation with the Lord. We can freely come and talk to the Lord. And in that, 
we should expect the Lord to respond. He speaks and he will speak to us. And sometimes as you know, we have seen that when they are covering their heads and it's about the toga and this social status, it, it, it's about the acceptance of the many, the crowd. Uh, you know, I, I want to be appreciated. I, I want to be, and so I'm going to pray good things over you guys and, and all these things. I want to be the intermediator between you and God. I want to be something important. And it all comes to the acceptance of the crowd and the folks in there. They make you important by allowing you to be that intermediator. And yet Paul and God and the Bible is saying you're important because God said so. God loves you. And it was he who declared that love. And then even in the high priest garments, and he's showing how every detail down to the finest detail, God has commanded and he's looked at. And it's a display of his reverence for that position of this high priest thing. And that Jesus is the high priest and you're the wife of Jesus. And so when you're out there in, in amongst the city and the crowd, you walk around with a sense of dignity, a sense of pride. You, you represent Christ's wife in public places and public areas. And so we walk in, in a way that honors that. And that's not always easy. We get upset, we get frustrated, we get disappointed, because usually people can't live up to our expectations. And so we, we, we want to lash out sometimes, or we want to unfriend people sometimes. And sometimes maybe that's for our own protection, and other times it might just be because we're weak. <laughs> I'm a weak person in those things. <clears throat> so a man who comes to try and pray and be your voice is disgracing that person. Whether it's a woman or another man or whoever it is, we should all have our own voice in prayer and come to the Lord. He also says, verse 16, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Paul is saying, come as you are. We, we don't practice any of these head coverings or non-head coverings or any of those things. Those are all traditions, a part of the culture that they're trying to bring in. We don't practice any of these things. We just freely come to God by faith in his love. He goes on to say, verse 17, in the following, but in the following instructions, I do not command you because when you come together, it is for the better, but is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in part, for there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not, is it not the Lord's Supper that you eat? For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. And what? Do you not know, do you not have houses to eat in and to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I command you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's a great reminder that it's about what he's done for us and not what we're doing for him. And even though he includes us in to good works, I have appointed you to bear fruit, and the fruit he has appointed us to bear is love, forgiveness, patience, and the fruits of the Spirit, a sense of forbearance and tolerance, and what is creating the divisions in the churches, and even in this time, they have divisions and all this stuff. Our humanity creates the divisions. Our sinful nature, the, the flesh of, of what we really are. And so we, we partake in the Lord's Supper and the breaking of the bread as a reminder that it's about his love for us. It's about what he did for us. And that brings us back to a place of reality. It, it, it brings to us back the ability to love someone who isn't perfect. It gives us that ability. Because I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. And so a good husband loves his wife in her imperfection. And a good wife loves her husband in his perfection. That's kind of what makes love and marriage sacred and holy and separated from all other types of love is I love you in your brokenness. I, I love you in your weakness, in, in your darkness. I, I love all the mistakes and the problems that are in there because that's the only way a marriage could work. Long lasting marriages don't work because yeah, I married a perfect wife and, and I married a perfect husband. No, I married a wife who has lots of forgiveness. I married a husband who has lots of forgiveness. And that's what makes marriages and relationships last a long time. And that's what Jesus, Paul, is saying here, that it's about my forgiveness. This is what makes our bond so strong. This is what I did for you. I broke my body for you. I laid my life down for you. And what did I do these things for? Because you were imperfect. You were broken. You weren't able to do the things God has asked of us to do. And yet I, I did these things out of love, says the Lord. Verse 27 says this. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So a lot of the things that come to our lives through bad decisions, comes negative reactions, like you steal, you probably go to jail. Every action comes with a reaction, and it could be negative, and yet those things have been put in place for our discipline. Not because God doesn't love us, not because God desires for to unload on us wrath and lots of problems and issues and heartache. It's to turn us away from those things that are harmful for us and 
harmful for our communities and things of that nature. And so it, again, when we have that head covering and that, and it, and we look at ourselves and even if the whole world is living in darkness and the whole world is living in sin and, and the whole world is full of violence and war and all these problems, at the end of the day, I only have control over me. And only me can choose to participate in it or not to participate in it. It's up to me to be whoever I am and if I'm out there trying to please the world, I'm never going to measure up. But if I'm trying to please God, then I'm going to live my life in such a way that even if I was the last person on earth who believed in God, I was the last person on earth who reverenced God, I'm going to live my life in such a way that even if I was in a room full of gossipers, the only thing they could gossip about me was, boy, that guy sure loves Jesus, or that woman sure loves Jesus because of the way they display their lives. And so it's a reflection of those things. They should see within us our love and our dedication to the Lord. By the way we forgive, by the way we're patient, by the way we're willing to, to carry another person's burdens, make them our own. And a lot of these things, and even in the breaking of the bread, is I am carrying your burden. I am delivering to you what you need. I, I know you're weak. I know you need food. I know you need nourishment. And then all that comes through my presence, through my body, through my blood, and these things. And we ought to be willing to live our lives in, in such a way it reflects our love for the Lord. Love as I have loved you, says the Lord. And, and that's what we do. And so when disappointing things happen in our world and in our lives, we look at ourselves and what choice could I make differently? What could I have I done differently? And when we think of those things, I think we're pleased, we're pleasing to God. It's not about the acceptance of others. It's about our reverence for the Lord. And that's the thing also with the breaking of the body is he says, if you do it unworthily, do you have reverence for the Lord? Is he your husband? And if he was your husband, do you pick him apart and eat him? Like, you know, and it doesn't have to be, do we pick one another apart and, and do we break one another down? If I love the Lord, do I really find honor in breaking him apart and tearing him down, subjecting him to public shame and humiliation? Or do I see that as an opportunity to bind up his wounds and to care for him, to love him. He says in verse 33, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things, I will give you directions when I soon come. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Evidence the Holy Spirit is in us. Evidence that God has covered us in his seal and in his presence comes through our willingness to confess Jesus Christ is the Lord. When he's saying the Lord in the Old Testament, Hanunai, the Lord is our God, Yahweh, 
or however it is you like to pronounce that name, that's Jesus. Jesus is God, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit anyone confesses those things. We respond with love and forgiveness. And that shows a certain amount of love for us. That even in our weaknesses, even in our imperfections, God is still willing to be with us and to say we are his children. We should think about that. If God says someone out there is holy and concentrated to him for a holy purpose, and we should reverence that and honor God's respect for that person by loving them just as we would love ourselves. And all of it, it comes down to love. <laughs> Do we love the Lord? And we see it even here the things I struggle with is sometimes as we have come into this place and as a family we have all kinds of aspirations and ambitions and ideas on how to make this place a success. And, and what determines its success? Well, for many people it's the income. It's the incoming, whether it's financial income, or people gathering together, but in it, I think what makes it a success is even absent of any income, absent of anybody coming, we still hold it in high esteem by showing reverence for this place and saying this is the place where we believe God has dedicated for the gathering and the gathering of believers. And so while we're here in this place, we hope that people would come here because they need hope. I want you to find hope. I want you to find community. I want you to find a friend. I want you to find comfort. I want you to be able to find the presence of the living God. And that starts with myself. And if nobody has reverence for this place, I will have reverence for this place because I love Jesus Christ. And that's what makes it successful. It is, God is saying it, it's, it's about me and you. It's about us. And, and, and wherever you are, you can be in that success so long as God is present with you. And, and that's where it is. We find success in the gathering of the Spirit. Yes, where two or more gather in the name of Jesus. Surely there he is. But there's you, there's God, the Holy Spirit. Surely Jesus is present with you. So no matter, no matter where you are, God is there. God is with you. And I think that if we could grasp that and put it in us, and it's hard to do, we would walk around in the world in a little bit of a different light. I see a lot of people wear tattoos, and I don't say it's bad to have tattoos and, and you can't come to the Lord and, and rededicate your life to the Lord and have a transformation in your life while wearing tattoos. Those things are certainly possible, but I think it's okay too to train our daughters and to teach her young women that it's okay to be holy. And how you display a sense of holiness is by recognizing your body is the Lord's body. It is the Lord's temple. And in you, the Lord shines his love. And it's okay to live our lives and say, you know, God accepts me just as I am to our little children. And then they don't have this desire to change what they are or to graffiti their bodies or to improve what God has made for them. Just as they are, 
God loves them. And I think that's important for all of us. If I could just love people just as they are, things would go a lot smoother. We'd find a lot more peace. And that's hard to do, especially when I struggle to love myself just as I am. So that's what we're finding today. In, verse, in chapter 12, verse 12, Paul reminds us of this. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, through me, though many, are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized unto one body. Jews were Greeks, slaves were free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not the eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unrepresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are of the body of Christ and individual members of it. And if God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, and then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do, not, do all work miracles. Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you still more an excellent way. And when Paul is saying, earnestly desire the higher gifts, the gift of love and the ability to love. And then he begins to speak of love. And what is love? And that being the greatest gift of all, because even if you could prophesy, or you had the ability to speak in tongues, or you could be a miracle worker, and, and if you were void of love, you have nothing. And in all of it, that's what we find in Jesus Christ, what binds us together, what makes us important to God, love. His love for us that is found in Jesus Christ. And so we don't pick one another apart. We don't devour one another. We don't try to break one another down because in breaking each other down, we're breaking down Jesus Christ. And yet it is love that unites us. And it's love that is going to heal us. And it's love that's going to provide the miracles we 
so need. Love is the source. God is love. And he's the essence of love. And everything we know about love is because we have come to know God. And so he's with us and he's in us. Let us love one another. Love yourself and love your neighbors. And in that would be loving God. Just as a wife loves her husband. So that's what I got for today. <laughs> uh, I'll say a little prayer, and then I got a little music to listen to that just kind of absorb it. As I believe God is pouring out His Spirit on all flesh, and He pours His Spirit out through these songs. And uh, sometimes we just listen to Him and, and use that as an opportunity to meditate and to think on the depths of God's love, which we may never come to fully understand because it's an, an eternal process. And so we got a long ways to go. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for desiring to marry us and to bring us into your heart and to hold us and to clothe us and to keep us safe. Thank you, Jesus, for all the love you have shown us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all the good we have found in you. Thank you, Father, for your protection. We ask one thing, that your face would shine upon us and that we'd find a blessing. Let your love be the blessing we find. Thank you, Jesus, and amen.